Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. We usually think about the Shana part of the holiday, the upcoming new year. But I want to talk about the Rosh part, the head. More specifically, what goes on the head. Never before has a kippah been so talked about as much as the kippah on Naftali Bennett's head. When Naftali Bennett became the Prime Minister of Israel, he also became the first religious Prime Minister and the first Prime Minister to regularly wear a kippah. This is a big deal. And there were many articles about the serious implications of the kippah. What does this mean politically, religiously, philosophically? There was also talk about the more entertaining fashion side of the type of kippah that he wears. It's a knitted kippah, a kippah suga, about the size of this kippah that I have in my drawer. Given that Bennett wears this kippah on the back of his head, and since he doesn't have very much hair, there were even articles about how he keeps the kippah on. One article quoted him saying that once he used a wad of chewed bubble gum to keep the kippah on the back of his head. On the one hand, this is all just in good fun. But on the other hand, the kippah and what it symbolizes is quite significant. All the talk about Bennett's kippah reminded me of this kippah that I have had sitting in my drawer for about 12 years, 11 months, and two weeks. I know that exactly because it was given to us as a baby gift when my oldest son, Roni, was born. And in two weeks from now, he'll have his bar mitzvah. As I hold this kippah in my hands and I reflect on the symbolism of this kippah, I think back to his birth about 13 years ago. I never could have predicted that my children would have grown, grown up in Baltimore at Beth Tefillah. I'll be honest with you, I had never even heard of Pikesville before we moved here and found out that we weren't living in Baltimore, we were living in Pikesville. When I first came here about 11 years ago, I thought that the parents of the bar and bat mitzvah boys and girls, I thought they were old. Now I'm a parent of a bar and bat mitzvah, bar mitzvah boy, so I realize they're really not that old. This year is a symbolic year not only for me and my family, but for this whole congregation as we enter our centennial year. It's a year of transition. It's a year of celebrating our history and planning for our future. And in that spirit, symbols really matter. We learned that this past year. I hope that you notice that we have a new logo, which we unveiled as part of our centennial year. We wanted to use this opportunity to unite the BT community, the shul and the school, with one visual identity. We wanted this symbol to reflect Beth Tefillah's history, mission, culture, and values. Now, I've never gone through a process of deciding on a logo before. It seemed to me it would be pretty simple. You sit down, you sketch a few pictures, you pick the one that you like. I was definitely wrong about that. This did not happen overnight. It was a months long process made up of meetings and working groups and professionals and staff and lay people, all to come up with just the right symbol because symbols matter. And symbols most definitely matter on Rosh Hashanah. What's the most important Rosh Hashanah symbol? Everyone's got their favorite, apples and honey, pomegranates, round challah, raisin challah, fish. These are all important, delicious, and fun and enjoy them. But if I had to pick one object that most symbolizes Rosh Hashanah, it would certainly be the shofar. The shofar isn't only a top Rosh Hashanah symbol, it's also easily a top five of all Jewish symbols. The shofar is a great symbol. One of my most favorite things to do as a rabbi is to blow shofar for kids leading up to Rosh Hashanah. I love seeing the curiosity on their faces when I explain the different sounds that a shofar makes. I love how their eyes light up when I hold a long note of a tekiah gedola. And I love seeing their smiles when I pull off successfully blowing two shofars at once. The shofar is such a powerful tool for engaging kids. It's simple, it's clear, it's quick and easy. I wish that I could bottle the magic of the shofar and use it all year round. But it's not only the children that the shofar speaks to. Adults are moved by the shofar as well, whether it's their first time hearing the blasts or they've heard it for years. 
there's something about the chauffeur that just works. What makes it so effective? I want to suggest that there are three elements that make the chauffeur the powerful symbol that it is. Number one, the chauffeur is authentic. Think about it. All synagogues, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, Ashkenazic, and Sephardic, all synagogues use the very same chauffeur. Now we have different sidurim, we have different talises, we have different types of kippot. By the way, we even have different Torahs. The words are the same, but the Torahs are different. But the chauffeur is the same. It's the same because it remains unchanged, authentic, from generation to generation, going all the way back to the very beginning of time. The chauffeur takes us back to Abraham's life in the famous story that we read in Rosh Hashanah. Abraham was prepared to sacrifice Yitzchak as God had told him, and his son is then spared. Upon hearing this, he looks around and he sees a ram stuck in the thicket, which he sacrifices to Hashem in place of Yitzchak. According to our sages, that ram had been created at the beginning of time. I was simply waiting there for its purposes to be fulfilled. We recall that ram through blowing the shofar, the ram's horn. So the shofar goes all the way back to the very beginning of the world. You don't get more authentic than that. And there are laws that mandate that the shofar must remain in its purest form. The Rambam, for example, writes, if one made any addition to a shofar, whether of its kind or from another substance, it's unacceptable. Should one coat the shofar with gold from the inside or at the mouthpiece, it's unacceptable. You might have thought, add some gold, it's very nice. We don't add on to the shofar, we don't change the shofar because it must remain in its original, purest and most authentic form. And that authenticity speaks to people. Authenticity speaks to people in a deep and profound way. It connects us with something larger than ourselves. The shofar connects us to our people through the generations, to the ups and the downs and the peaks and the valleys. And we're all searching for that type of connection. So the shofar is authentic. But authenticity isn't enough. It isn't enough because if it isn't accessible, if it isn't relevant, and many won't even be able to connect with that authenticity. Authentic, yes, but relevant as well. And that's the second element of the chauffeur that contributes to its success. The chauffeur is relevant. If God had created that ram, but Avraham didn't see it at the moment that he was looking for something to replace Yitzchak, the ram's horn wouldn't ever have become the chauffeur. In order for that ram's horn to become the chauffeur, it had to be relevant to Avraham. You can have a great product, but if it isn't relevant, it's not going to sell. And the chauffeur is relevant to us. It wasn't only reachable to Avraham, it's been nearby for us as a people, right next to us in major moments throughout our history. As Rabbi Sachs, Zichor Levracha of Blessed Memory writes in his commentary to the Rosh Hashanah Master that we use, it's on page 498, 499 if you want to check out the full commentary. He says the following, the shofar, it sounded when the Israelites heard the voice of God and accepted the covenant at Sinai. It accompanied them into battle in the days of Joshua and Jericho. In the Jubilee year, it became the sound of freedom. It was an alarm warning people of impending danger. It was, said Isaiah, the sound of the great shofar that would signal the ingathering of the exiles when Israel returned to its land. It was sounded in 1967 during the Six Day War at the intensely emotional moment when Jews were able again to pray at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. It is the sound of judgment, and it is the sound of God's majesty. The shofar seems to always be there. The shofar is also relevant because it understands that in order to speak to us, it must be accessible. If Avram had seen the ram, but it was too high up to reach, the story would have ended differently. If the ram was high up on a cliff rather than stuck in a thicket, it would have never replaced Yitzchak. The shofar represents a low bar for admission. Anyone can walk into a shul and hear the shofar sound and be moved by its blasts. You don't need to understand Hebrew to understand the shofar. You don't need a background or previous knowledge. It is easily accessible and relevant. And people want relevance. They're looking for opportunities to connect not only with something authentic, but with something relevant, something that speaks to them in their lives, and especially with something meaningful, 
something that can inspire them. And that is the third ingredient to the success of the chauffeur. The chauffeur is authentic, the chauffeur is relevant, and finally, the chauffeur inspires. In fact, that is the entire purpose of the chauffeur. As the prophet Amos says, Imi taka shofar ba'ir v'am lo yecharadu. Can a chauffeur be sounded in a town and people not take alarm? The chauffeur's call is a call to action. The Rambam famously explains that the chauffeur's blasts are a wake-up call. The goal of the chauffeur is to inspire us and drive us to tshuva. Its purpose to inspire us to lead better lives. That's why we blow the chauffeur for the whole month of Elul leading up to Rosh Hashanah, and that is why we blow the chauffeur on Rosh Hashanah. The chauffeur is a wordless prayer. It's a call from the depths of our souls, from the inner breath that Hashem placed into our neshama. The chauffeur is inspiration. And who amongst us is not looking for inspiration? These three ingredients, authentic, relevant, and inspiring, are the three components that make the chauffeur the powerful symbol that it is. Through it, we connect with the past, we find relevance in the present, and we become inspired for the future. It's why the chauffeur is the focal point of Rosh Hashanah davening. And this is also why I believe that as we stand here at the 100th high holiday service of Beth Tefillah, the chauffeur holds the key to our future here at BT and in the Jewish world as a whole. Because I believe that these very same three essentials are what people are looking for in their lives today. And if people find these elements in the shul and in Judaism, they will come. Authenticity. We live in a world where very little is sacred any longer. Kedza culture means doing away with authenticity. We've seen canceling of such traditional pillars as the flag of the United States, the national anthem, the history that we teach. At a time when our foundations are crumbling, it's destabilizing and disorienting. And it leaves people looking for something time-tested, something long-standing, something true, something authentic. It does not get more authentic than the Jewish tradition. It is simply astounding how deeply we are connected with our past. Yes, an Orthodox synagogue certainly has its share of challenges in keeping up with the times. We'll talk about those in a moment. But when it comes to authenticity, well, what is more authentic than praying in the very same language with the very same words that our ancestors used thousands of years ago? What is more authentic than learning from the very same books and the very same texts that our sages pass down one generation to the next? What is more authentic than practicing the very same customs and traditions that our Bubbies and our Zaydis practiced in their lives? You want authentic, we have got authentic. But authentic isn't enough. There's a reason Judaism has survived and thrived throughout our history. And that's because the rabbis, the sages, the leaders in each generation continue to innovate and mold that tradition in ways that allowed it to remain relevant to each person at each period of time. From the moment I came to Beth to Philo, what I most admired about Rabbi Wahlberg was his willingness and his courage not to be afraid to try new ideas to keep the shul fresh and vibrant. Rabbi Shemeshon Fall Hirsch describes the, the danger of not evolving. He writes that some people misunderstand Judaism and look upon it as a, quote, lifeless framework, as something that should be laid in the grave of a long since dead and buried past. In fact, he explains that even some very religiously committed Jews treat Jewish practice as a mechanical habit. They bear it in their hands as a sacred relic, a revered mummy, and fear to rouse its spirit. Judaism must continue to be relevant and speak to people in their daily lives. Indeed, over the past year and a half, at a time when many thought that shuls would be less relevant to people, we instead discovered just how relevant shuls can be to people. But people couldn't go to shuls, the shuls went to the people. Rabbis and staff worked extra hard to be relevant to people in their lives. Shuls weren't afraid to try new things, to think outside of the box, to experiment and innovate, all in an effort to reach and engage and remain relevant 
for their members. We must be relevant, but we must also be inspiring. Inspiration, perhaps more than anything, is what people are thirsting for today. We watch the news, we read the papers, we look at comments on social media, and we walk away feeling so dejected, so hopeless. There's so much bad out there. People want a Judaism that's authentic and that's relevant, but like the chauffeur, they also want one that's inspiring. We all want meaning in our lives, and people search all over for that inspiration. If they're searching for that inspiration out there, then we have to do a better job bringing that inspiration in here. These are the three ingredients to our future here at Beth Tefilla. We're in an historic year for our community. Beth Tefilla turns 100. It's an impressive milestone. What's even more impressive is that we continue not only to survive, but to thrive. And that success is largely due to the fact that Beth Tefilla has always been authentic, relevant, and inspiring. We combine our authenticity, tradition, with relevance the world around us. Over our 100 years, we've continuously found ways to continue to inspire. And that's exactly what we're going to do as we move into the next 100 years. I mentioned our new logo before. What I love about the new logo is that it symbolizes the iconic roof of our main sanctuary, the kippah on the head of our shul. And the roof lines can be seen sloping towards a Magin David, towards a Jewish star. It also resembles hands reaching upwards toward even greater heights. And you should know that as a part of our centennial plans, we intend to reopen the skylight so that the light can shine in. It's my hope that light will not only shine in from the outside, but that light will also extend from within this special place to the world outside. As we say in Kaddish during these high holidays, le'ela u'le'ela, above and beyond, higher and higher. That's where we're going. And I hope that you will join with us. Wishing you all a shana tova umetukah, happy and a healthy and a sweet new year. May Hashem bless you with the air of authenticity, relevance, and inspiration. Shana Tova to everyone. And for those of you who won't have the opportunity to hear the chauffeur over Rosh Hashanah, here is a little taste to take with you. Shana Tova.